Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Keep, O Lord, your household, the church, in your steadfast faith and love, that through your grace we may proclaim your truth with boldness and minister your justice with compassion. For the sake of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now I invite you to sit back and hear the lessons. Our first lesson is from Genesis chapter 18. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre, and he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread, that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham hastened to the tent to Sarah, and said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it, and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, where is your wife, Sarah? And he said, there in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season and your wife, Sarah, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now, Sarah, Abraham and Sarah were old, <laughs> advanced in age, and it had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. She was in menopause. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I've grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? <laughs> the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah say, why did Sarah laugh? and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, oh yes, you did laugh. Here ends the lesson. Our psalm response is a portion of Psalm 116. It starts in the first and second verse and then continues on to verses 10 and 17 if you are following along at home. I love the Lord because he has heard the voice of my supplication, because he has inclined his ear to me whenever I called upon him. How shall I repay the Lord for all the good things he has done for me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the, peace, in the presence of his, all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his servants. O oh Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant and the child of your handmaid. You have freed me from my bonds. I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. Hallelujah. We continue on to the second reading, which is from the letter to the Romans. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, 
because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Here ends the lesson. Our final reading is from the Gospel. We are reading from the Gospel of Matthew today, starting in the ninth chapter. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. The Gospel of the Lord. (sighs) Good morning. This morning, we wake up to a changed world. It's not just the pandemic this morning. It's not just race riots this morning. This morning, we wake up to a world that is beginning to change yet again. And we see steps forward in the world and we see steps backwards in the world. But one of the things that I've always held true, and I I wish I had the research references to back this up for you, but this is one of the things that I suspect is true. When we want to make really big change in our, in our personal lives or in our corporate lives, our civic lives, the world, politics, nations, states, when we want to make positive change, we can go about it any number of ways. We can try to change everything all at once Kind of like when you're trying to give up smoking because you're like, no, it needs to happen. It's got to happen. It's finally going to happen. This time it's going to happen. And you just give it up cold turkey. And, you know, I have heard that that does work for some people. But for a lot of people, it works like on the fifth try. And it's easy to remember. Oh, yeah, I gave up smoking cold turkey on the fifth try. So the first four tries didn't work. And when giving up an addiction, very often you do have to go cold turkey. And it's, it's some level of horrible. Whether it's alcohol as an addiction, or smoking as an addiction, or caffeine as an addiction, or other drugs as an addiction. There's the addictive quality that makes it a physical agony to give up. But that's just one way in which we might change as as an individual. And of course, you know, I talk about this not because I want to get political, but because I think that God calls us into becoming the best person that we can become. God calls us into becoming the healthiest 
and happiest version of who we are. And so, as I read the news this morning, before coming and doing worship with you, as I read the news this morning, you can look at all of the strife and the anguish and the agony, and you can see only the brokenness of our world. That is a valid way of seeing. Or you can look at the strife and the anguish and the agony of our world right now, and you can see a world that is trying to give up an addiction, several addictions. Now here I'm not talking about smoking, not talking about caffeine. I'm not talking about the small private personal addictions not talking about heroin. I'm talking about white supremacy. I'm talking about transphobia. I'm talking about those addictions that we hold as a people. Now, you might say, but Mother Sarah, those aren't addictions. Well, I deal in metaphors. I don't know if you noticed. Holy Scripture, it's story, it's metaphor. It's a way for you to understand that A, God loves you more than you can possibly imagine. B, God wants you to get on board with his program, his, her, it program. God doesn't have a gender. <laughs> Thank God. And C, this is your destiny. This is what you're meant to do in the world. And it is not hubris. It is not pride to know that you are thoroughly loved by God. And it is not hubris and it is not pride to know that you are the light of the world. And with the light of the world comes rights and responsibilities. And if you choose not to exercise them, that's okay. God will wait forever. You'll get on board eventually. It's fine. So in order to say these three things, God loves you. God wants you to be the best version. God wants you to get on board. There's a lot of story. There's a lot of metaphor. There's a lot of ways to try to say it over and over and over again so this group of people will understand and this group of people will understand and this group of people will understand all throughout history which can be a little confusing when you just read it literally all the time <laughs> but coming back to the news this morning you can look at it all and think Gah! It's so horrible. It's so agonizing. What is the state of our world coming to? Late night comedians are calling for Canada to invade us and to put us out of our misery. And while, you know, that's all quite tongue in cheek, there's an ache there to not be in agonized misery. And it's an understandable ache. But the other way to see this is that these are the growing pains that are unfortunately necessary when you give up addictions. So I have this theory. I have this theory that if you want to change and you want to do systemic change which is a technical term for for saying that you don't want to change little surface things you don't just want to change your clothes or your hair color you want to do deep change you want to do solid change you want to do real change so you don't just want to lose weight you want to get heart healthy you want to change the way you you think about food you deal with food you want to change something at its most basic level. It's the difference between urging children to read more and changing the way we educate children. 
That's the kind of difference. Urging children to read more, very helpful, very helpful, but helpful at a kind of top or surface level. It helps the individual child that you urge to read, and it does help them. But when you change the way we educate children, you change all the lives of the children for all the years to come, not just one child. So that is systemic change. When you change the whole system, not just one person. So my theory about systemic change is that if you want to do it and you want it to stick, like you want it to be solid, you want it to last, you don't just want it to be like, well, I'm here and I'm in charge, so I'm going to change things. And then when you're not there and you're not in charge, uh, things go back to the way they were. Or they get even worse than they were. Kind of like when you try to lose weight and you go on a fad diet. Not that I have any experience with this whatsoever. Uh, and you lose weight and it's very exciting. And then you go off the fad diet and you gain all that weight back plus more. It's like that. Because you didn't do systemic change. So when you do systemic change, it lasts beyond your immediate tinkering. So my thought about systemic change is that you can try to do everything all at once, but that's hard and that tends to not stick. To do really solid systemic change, you actually have to take baby steps, small incremental steps that allow you, you know, you take one baby step and then you maybe take another baby step and then by the time you take the third baby step, and you know, some of the group is with you, whether you're doing it in a church or a business or a country or a world. Some of the people who think, yeah, you're right on, you're totally right, they're with you from the start. They're like, okay, we're gonna take baby steps. Are you ready? Three, two, one, step! And they're ready. But there will always be people who don't agree with you. That's, <laughs> that's human nature. There will always be people who think, no, you're wrong. You're just wrong. And so when you take baby steps, the thing that happens is that the people who agree with you are so impatient. They're like, come on, we can take bigger steps. We can take bigger steps. It can be awesome. We're so great. We can do this. We're going to change the world. And they can take bigger steps. That's true. But the people who disagree with you don't want to take any steps. And the joy of taking baby steps with a pause in between each one is that it allows time for all the people who disagree with you <laughs> and all the various reasons why they disagree with you to see that that, that that one baby step was a good thing. And so suddenly when you take baby steps and you make small incremental change toward your healthy goal, toward your healthy future, and you have the patience and compassion for the people who disagree with you, which is a little bit like saying love your enemies. You have the patience and compassion for the people who disagree with you and perhaps want to take your rights away from you. You give them time to catch up. You give them time to realize, actually, that's not so bad. And so if you do that, if you take baby steps, if you give space in between, by the time you're on the third step, all the people who disagree with you are taking the first step for granted now. They're taking that first step for granted and they're defending the rights of that first step. Which three years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, you would have never imagined. A generation ago, that person holding those views would never 
have taken that one step toward this beautiful future. Now, are they ready to take the second step? No, no, they're not. Can it be infuriating that they're not taking the second step to say nothing of the third? Are, is it infuriating that they're not taking larger steps? It can be. We can really work ourselves up into a lather. Or we can look back and say, can you believe it has come to the day, finally, when this sort of person is willing to defend that first step? And if we continue to go slowly and gently, that person will take the second step. And it's true, we might still be three steps ahead of them. But the detractors begin to see that these small steps are normal. They're reasonable. They're rational. And all of the other arguments fall away. I say this thinking of white supremacy and thinking of the long, hard slog from the time of our Civil War in the 1850s to the 2020s, the long, hard slog it has been for justice and equality for black people and for white people to realize When people of color are subjugated, are held back, we are advanced. And it doesn't matter if we're in an all white community or an all black community or a totally multi ethnic, multiracial community. When one group is held back, everyone else is pushed forward. When women are held back, men are pushed forward. When black people are held back, white people are pushed forward. When people of any other race, not just black, are held back, everyone else is pushed forward. When queer people are held back, everyone else is pushed forward. Now you can look at this and think, well, if some people aren't held back, well then, then I'm going to lose something useful and necessary to my life. No. No, actually, no. That is an error in thinking. And that is, that is a, it's not just a mental fallacy. I'm going to, I'm going to call it for what it is. It is an evil thought sponsored by the enemy. Because remember, this book tells us that God loves everyone. And that actually means everyone. And we don't get to get away with just having the knowledge that God loves everyone. Well, God loves everyone, so I don't have to. Mm, no. God loves everyone and God is our model for how to love. So, we need to practice loving everyone. This is a common refrain for me. If you've heard me preach before, you will recognize this. But there's a saying that a rising tide raises all boats. A rising tide lifts all boats, not just some, not just the white boats, not just the male boats, not just the straight boats. God's love is a rising tide. It's not a piece of the pie where yours gets smaller if someone else's gets larger. No, no, no. God's love is the tide. It's the whole ocean. It's not just a tiny glass of water where if you give someone else a sip, you lose a sip. God's love is the ocean. And when the tide comes in, everyone sets sail. But I say this too, thinking about the comments in the blog post that a, a famous author um, who has been known for her positive and affirming views on gays and lesbians, um, the comments of a famous author who came out as 
anti-trans. Uh, she doesn't think transgendered people are a thing. And transgendered people are pretty sure that they're a thing. And a lot of the rest of the world are pretty sure that transgendered thing, transgendered people, like it's a thing. And the difficulty here is here's a woman who's on step two and she has defended step two. She has come out and used her influence and promoted step two. But the people who are on step five, when they discover she's only on step two, are outraged. I'm not saying that I agree with any of her comments because I don't. Well, I think transgendered is a thing. But had we not made, and I say we, the queer community, LGBTQIA, had we not made the strides that we have made, there wouldn't be people sitting on step two defending it with their last breath. Writing books where important moral characters are gay. And so there's a lot of controversy right now. And we can focus on the controversy and the angst and the pain. We can focus on the controversy and the angst and the pain of white supremacy. Or we can roll up our sleeves and ask ourselves, wherever we are, whomever we are, whatever step we might be on, we can ask ourselves, what is the next step that God wants us to take? What is the next step that God wants me to take? It's going to be a baby step. It's going to be a small incremental thing because that's what's healthy and that's what's sustainable and that's what will help our brothers and sisters in the world get on board our brothers and sisters whom we disagree with and whom we are still called to love what is the next step that i have to take to help dismantle white supremacy what is the next step that i have to take to stand in solidarity with my queer brothers and sisters, to let them know that they are loved and that they deserve every happiness. What's the next step? It's gonna be small. It's gonna be small. But if you are asking yourself this question, and I hope that you are, know that God is already providing you with an answer. It's already present in your life because that is how God works. And God is only waiting for us to listen. And we can. Amen. Our worship continues on with the Nicene Creed. If you're following along in your Book of Common Prayer, this is on page 358. If you are not following along with a printout or your Book of Common Prayer, I invite you to just sit back and listen. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, Eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, 
who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We look for the resurrection of the dead. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. These are the prayers of the people. Almighty God, during this time of social distancing, self-quarantine, and rioting, and peaceful protesting, we ask that you remind us of our deep connection with one another. Help us to reach out in love and safe ways to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. Fill our hearts with compassion for those who must work with others and risk exposure, for those who need to work but cannot, for those juggling childcare and working from home. For those who have been infected by coronavirus, for all those who are suffering and in pain from other illnesses, we pray that they may be made well and whole once more. For all those who have died, who have died without justice, for cities who are peacefully protesting, for those who are filled with hope and for those filled with despair, for those whose faith was clear and for those whose faith is known to you alone, we pray that they may rest in peace. We pray for our nation and for all those in authority, the president, the governor, our county executives, our local leaders, and the CDC, that they may make wise decisions and have right actions for the welfare and benefit of us all. We pray for Trinity Church, for Sarah, Michael, and Rose, for Janice and Andy, for Joanne and Bruce, for Linda and Ernie, for Joan, Susan, Matthew, and Lynn, for Michelle, JJ, Alana, and Mariah, for Bob, Bonnie, Susan, Ted, and Reggie, for Lorraine and Deb, Rich, Linda, Lena, Freya, Parker, Jackson, Jocelyn, Jordan, Chris, Colin, and Kelly, for Kathy and Joanne, for Walter and Jane, for Chris and Judy. We pray for our families, friends, and neighbors, especially for Holy Apostles Perry and St. Luke's Attica, for our local churches here in Warsaw, and for Jamie, Pam, David, James and Barb D, Marilyn G, Anne, Jane, George, Phil, Steve W, and those others that you may name now. We pray for all those in the military and for those in the National Guard who have been mobilized for the safety and welfare of our nation. And especially we pray for Robert. Lord, hear the prayers of your people and grant that we have what we have asked faithfully, grant that we may obtain effectually to the glory of your name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now is our Savior Christ, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia.